Rome, the holy city. From its ancient ruins to the breathtaking opulence of the Vatican, there is no place else like it. Rome is a study in contrasts, modern and archaic, exposed and mysterious. For Dan Brown, the best-selling author of modern thrillers, Rome is a conspirator's dream city, layered with the secrets of its history. In Dan Brown's Angels and Demons, the familiar maze of modern Rome hides an ancient conspiracy of astonishing betrayal and intrigue. Could famed scientist Galileo and Baroque artist Bernini be plotting together to destroy the Catholic Church? As a setting for his novel, Angels and Demons, Dan Brown uh, uses his location of the city of Rome brilliantly. He picks, of course, a city which is filled with churches, museums, and tourist sites, a city which is known to people for its beauty and its religious connections and its history, and he coordinates all of that in some way into the action of his story. Angels and Demons is a modern conspiracy thriller based on the age-old war between religion and science. An ancient secret society, the Illuminati, is scheming to destroy the Catholic Church, avenging centuries of hatred for its suppression of science. Robert Langdon has been called in to decipher the clues the Illuminati leaves in a cryptic trail across the city. As he races to thwart an Illuminati bomb planted beneath the Vatican, Langdon uncovers an even deadlier secret. The Illuminati's leaders were the scientist Galileo and one of the Vatican's most favorite artists, Gian Lorenzo Bernini. Could such eminent figures possibly be history's most unlikely traitors? Dan Brown is saying, everything you've heard before may be false. And Dan Brown has chosen, interestingly, to take the Baroque period, which is one of the least studied and least understood periods of time in the history of the city of Rome, because much of what we see in Rome today is not Renaissance, it's Baroque. It's really on a cutting edge of, on one side, uh, looking forward to a new world of science with Copernicus and Galileo, but at the same time, continuing belief in magic, astrology, a real interest and fascination with the pagan past, the, something the Italians have never been able to shake. In the novel, Dan Brown challenges us to imagine that prominent members of the church could have plotted its overthrow, which leads to even bigger questions. Just as in the Da Vinci Code, readers are forced to examine matters of faith in entirely new ways. Dan Brown has raised a lot of interesting questions that Catholics uh, and uh, non-Catholics alike are interested in. Uh, there's been just a huge furor and level of interest in reading about these issues that didn't exist before. Dan Brown's premise is seductive. The church has been under secret attack for centuries. An Illuminati sleeper cell has been lying in wait for just the right moment to take its revenge. Could this be true? The Illuminati is one of the most fascinating and real secret societies of all time. Its mysterious beginnings have tentacles that seem to spread throughout today's world. Did they really exist? Or is this another Dan Brown invention? According to Brown's protagonist, Robert Langdon, the deep rift that existed between science and the Catholic Church came to a head in the 1500s, when a group of Rome's most enlightened scientists began meeting secretly. They call themselves the Enlightened Ones, or the Illuminati. Langdon believes the sect died out centuries ago until he is summoned to solve the murder of astrophysicist Leonardo Vetra, who has been branded with a strange Illuminati symbol on his chest. This is where I sort of part ways with Dan Brown and his interpretation of who the Illuminati are. He presents an Illuminati that's based on the 18th century Enlightenment movement that seeks to literally destroy the Vatican and therefore destroy the Catholic Church and its power and its supposed control over the world. In 1776, a Bavarian law professor, Adam Weishaupt, did start a secret society he called the Illuminati. Its aim was to spread the Enlightenment ideals freedom of the individual, the power of reason, and the right of self-government. These ideas were very radical for their times because Europe was under the domination of the Catholic Church, 
and each country was ruled by either centralized monarchs or established nobility who had absolute rule. To avoid detection by the church, Weishaupt developed a complex system of secret rituals and codes. This combination of scholarship and skullduggery held great appeal to Enlightenment thinkers, and the organization spread rapidly. The actual organization had no more than a few thousand members in German-speaking areas of Central Europe. They were suppressed and basically put out of business by the late 1780s, so that we're talking here about an organization which was A, never very large, and B, which had an effective existence of perhaps uh, 12, 14 years at the most. From this organization, a mythology has grown, linking the Illuminati to conspiracies behind virtually every historical event from the French and American revolutions to the rise of communism and even America's Great Depression. These are the people who somehow or other are responsible in secret for many of the changes that affect the political and cultural reality of Western civilization ever since. Was there a direct continuum between the Illuminati today and perhaps Henry Kissinger? I doubt it. <laughs> Although it will take Robert Langdon several chapters before he unravels the connection between the Illuminati and its leaders Galileo and Bernini, the reader has met the ruthless killer recruited by the Illuminati to carry out their vendetta, the Hassassin. He's a fascinating character, very, very dark. He is spoken of as a descendant of a medieval Islamic cult called the Hashashim, or Nazari Ismaili. They still exist today, centered around the Aga Khan in India and in about 25 other countries, including the United States. The Hassassin is somewhat out of context, except if you think back to the Crusades, when the church did, in fact, use the Hassassin as a way of furthering their goals. They used the Hassassin to murder other Muslim leaders. So they formed an unholy alliance with the Hassassin. The Order of the Assassins was founded in Persia in 1060. They built a fortress near the Caspian Sea where they ruled for 166 years. Practicing as a secret sect within Islam, they committed very public assassinations, and always with a dagger. The stories of this group percolated westwards and were picked up by the Crusaders, and a legend arose that the behavior of the assassins could only be satisfactorily explained through rituals that involved the ingestion of hashish, and it is indeed from hashish that the term assassin comes. That's one of the reasons that people thought they were so crazy and why they became this myth of these maniacal hashish, stoned out, mind-controlled victims, Mar Marco Polo, uh, wrote a, a whole lot of material about them being drugged into um, a secret garden where they were then tantalized by women and, and all kinds of things that suggested uh, Muhammad's description of paradise, all of the pleasures of the flesh. Some see an eerie similarity between the assassin's mode of conduct and the Al-Qaeda terrorists of 9-11 who lived underground in sleeper cells in America before activating their plans. Assassins were placed as servants into the households of figures who were believed to be enemies, and they would serve their masters with great devotion, often for years. And then suddenly, and always in a public place, they would kill their masters and always with a dagger so that their own deaths then uh, were inevitable. Osama bin Laden has certainly taken a page from the playbook of Hassan-e-Sabah, the head of the assassins. They are, in my opinion, very 
different. There was very little of the kind of indiscriminate violence we see among today's terrorists. Frankly, it's a little racist, in, in my opinion. The person who attempted to assassinate Pope John Paul II was also of Turkish extraction, and that plays in very interestingly to this whole scenario, because uh, the uh, Hassassin were from the uh, Turkish part of uh, the Asia Minor. The murdered scientist Leonardo Vetra has been branded by the Hassassin with a strange symbol reading Illuminati. Langdon describes it as an ambigram, a symbol legible from every perspective. The Illuminati brands will soon mark the Vatican's most prominent cardinals, leading Langdon across Rome on a trail of gruesome murders. Could the Hassassin be operating on orders laid out centuries earlier by Illuminati founders Galileo and Bernini? The ambigrams are actually a modern invention, probably in the 1970s. Dan Brown found a man named John Langdon, the same name that ultimately goes with his lead character, Robert Langdon, who creates ambigrams for a living and got him to create the ambigrams that were used in Angels and Demons. It's not known to have really existed in the 17th century and certainly would not have been done in English, either in Italy or in, uh, in Germany where the Illuminati started. Could Galileo, one of history's most revered scientists, harbor such hatred for the Catholic Church? Could he have been the mastermind behind the Illuminati plot? Dan Brown creates the idea that during the uh, terrible period of the Inquisition in Europe and particularly in Rome, scientists uh, were particularly abused, tortured, uh, and made victims of the Inquisition because of their emphasis on scientific thought rather than religious thought. He has in mind, obviously, the case of Galileo, which is discussed uh, at length in the novel. Dan Brown has the idea that this happened to a lot of people, which is not true. Galileo was, in fact, put on trial for promoting Copernicus's radical theory that the Earth revolves around the sun. This totally contradicted the Earth-centered world described in the Bible, believed to be the literal word of God. To the church, Galileo was a traitor. He was smart enough to say, this is the real world I'm looking at. And it conflicts with some of these interpretations of the Bible. But he was nonetheless a religious man. So how does he reconcile this? He steps back and says, the Bible tells you how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go. It's a scientific revelation. What it meant was we can use our own powers of inquiry to deduce the nature of the world without reference to some document that exists on some premise that it is the unassailable truth. Copernicus published his groundbreaking theory in 1543, but it was largely overlooked. A century later, the Catholic Church's authority had been undermined by the Protestant Reformation, and it demanded obedience to doctrine. When Galileo came out supporting Copernican theory, he was met with stiff resistance. The discipline of science didn't really exist until the time of Galileo. And Galileo was willing to take a backseat to theologians on questions of theology, but he wanted the church to recognize the work that he was doing and his fellow scientists were doing as seeking truth through facts. The church, of course, saw scientists as a great threat to theology and to their beliefs at the time. The Pope asked Galileo to refrain from teaching Copernican theory as fact. Instead, the flamboyant scientist published a book, Dialogues on the Two Chief World Systems, which openly sided with Copernicus. He wrote not in Latin, the language of academics, but in vernacular Italian. Any Italian who was literate could read and follow his ideas. There's a challenge to the power of the state, and the power of the state was the power of the church. To make matters worse, the character who carried the church's view was called Simplicio. He was this slightly dim-witted character being helped along by the learned other characters in this conversation. The identity of the Pope was written all over this character. So he's making fun of the Pope, not just disagreeing with him. That would make you mad if you're the Pope, I would think. 
At his trial, Galileo agreed to sign a declaration of guilt, but only if a clause be removed that suggested he lapsed in his behavior as a Catholic. Galileo could deny everything he believed scientifically, but he could not bear to be seen as a bad Catholic. That's part of the reason why he was never condemned to death, but he just couldn't repress these ideas that he saw to be true. The scientist had every reason to be bitter. Could he have developed the Illuminati plot during his long years of imprisonment by the church? Galileo's battle with the church embodies the theme of angels and demons, the age-old clash between science and religion. Was Galileo, devoted to both, able to reconcile the crisis between his soul and his mind? Langdon confronts a modern-day version of Galileo's conflict when he is summoned to the CERN laboratories, where top-secret experiments are developing a highly volatile, dangerous substance called antimatter. CERN really is the world's leading physics research lab. Uh, it really is based in near Geneva in Switzerland. They really are working on the subject of antimatter at the CERN lab in Switzerland. They really did, as it is said in Angels and Demons, invent uh, the World Wide Web. It wasn't Al Gore. It is one of the most distinguished uh, research facilities in the world today. Leonardo Vetra, the murdered scientist, is also a priest who referred to himself as a new breed, a theophysicist. Unlike Galileo, who suffered for putting science before his faith, Vetra considers himself, first of all, a man of God. His secret experiments have produced the world's very first antimatter. He believes he has recreated the Big Bang moment of Genesis itself. Well, the Leonardo Vetra character, whom we meet at the very opening of the novel, is an echo of the very interesting Belgian cosmologist, Georges Lemaitre, early 20th century thinker and figure, who was a Catholic priest and was also an astronomer and physicist. And Lemaitre was the first person to actually articulate what we now know as the Big Bang hypothesis. The Genesis story in the Bible describes how God created the universe out of a dark, empty void. The description is eerily similar to the scientific theory of the Big Bang that from an infinitesimal atomic density, an explosion created matter, antimatter, light, and time. The Big Bang wasn't, we didn't just make this up. It was an observation. Edwin Hubble, the guy after whom our, the telescope, famous telescope is named, he looks out in the night sky, finds these fuzzy objects, finds out that they're other galaxies, like the Milky Way, whole island universes, if you will. And what are they doing? Are they just sitting there? No. They're moving away. The entire universe is in a state of expansion. You can ask the question, well, if we're expanding, what happens if you turn back the clock? What did the universe look like in the past? First person to do that calculation was George Lemaitre, a Jesuit priest, who looked at the equations of Einstein and says, back in time, this whole universe was much smaller and hotter and denser. Under those conditions, what kind of universe gets made? And thus was born the idea, informed by data, that the universe had a beginning, which today we call the Big Bang. Galileo believes science and religion were two complementary paths to the goal of understanding God. Brown's murdered scientist Leonardo Vetra has gone one step further. The bomb planted in the Vatican turns out to be a canister of antimatter stolen from Vetra's lab. Although Langdon finds it difficult to believe that a sect that died out centuries ago is still active, he must confront the evidence. The Illuminati has waited 400 years to unfold an act of perfect revenge, destroying the church with the very substance of the moment of Genesis. Scientists, they've taken us so close to understanding the origins of the entire universe. And yet, there are no answers in the scientific community for uh, what happened before the Big Bang. And this, of course, is the world of religion. Look at the number of books on the shelves that have the word God and the word physics somewhere in the title. Deep down, people want to reconcile science and religion. There's no guarantee that will ever happen. In fact, evidence points against it. But it doesn't stop people from wanting it. 
Leonardo Vetra's mysterious work at CERN involves accelerating subatomic particles in a vast collider. By sending the particles in opposing directions at extremely high speeds, they collide and explode. In Dan Brown's version, the impact sends off particles of matter and antimatter, literally what happened at the moment of the Big Bang. Theoretically, antimatter is the most explosive substance on the planet. But does such a deadly material actually exist? Antimatter's been around for most of the 20th century. It doesn't have the mystery in physics as it may still have with the general public, or as Dan Brown had intended in his storytelling. Hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars would be necessary uh, to create enough antimatter to actually use it as a terrorist weapon today. Not only that, no one has yet figured out how to transport it. In the novel Angels and Demons, we have the uh, bad guys conveniently sort of uh, putting it in a canister and, and hauling it around Europe. Well, that cannot be done today. What's the point? In modern society, we can already make nuclear devices that can completely destroy all of Rome, all of Italy, all of Europe. Dan was appealing to the scientific romance of antimatter because we know it's the favorite fuel of science fiction stories. As Langdon enters the Vatican in search of the Illuminati bomb, he encounters a world rich in history and intrigue, where ancient tradition collides with modern reality. Vatican City is the seat of governance for the Catholic Church. It is one of the world's most impregnable fortresses, monitored by the most sophisticated security technology available. A powerful bomb would threaten far more than the structure itself. Vatican City is really a postage stamp of a country. It's only 109 acres within the city of Rome itself. It's a sovereign state. It's the smallest such country in the world. The art treasures in the Vatican museums is unparalleled. The impact of a bomb, as Dan Brown posits in the novel, would be devastating spiritually, intellectually, uh, in the history of art to, uh, to demolish even one of the pieces, such as the Pietà was damaged a couple decades ago, would really affect the entire art world. The Trail of Clues ultimately sends Langdon deep beneath the Vatican in search of the hidden bomb, through earthen layers of history, all the way to St. Peter's tomb. It's been a tradition almost from the beginnings of Christianity that the Vatican Basilica stands over Peter's actual tomb near the site where he was martyred. But did the Vatican orchestrate a cover-up to hide the fact that Peter may not be buried there at all? The location of his tomb is thought to be where the original St. Peter's Basilica was built by the Emperor Constantine. This was more or less proven in the excavations undertaken by Pope Pius XII during World War II in secret, directly beneath the main altar of St. Peter's Basilica. The excavation unearthed an amazing find, an edicula, a marble memorial of two columns dedicated to St. Peter, which dated back to the second century. The stonework nearby had been scrawled with ancient Christian graffiti. One of the most important aspects of the excavation beneath St. Peter's Basilica is the existence of a graffito that states Peter is here. The Idicula was a tomb that they thought belonged to St. Peter, but when they opened it, they discovered that there was nothing in it. The church then brought in another expert who produced bones she claimed were those of a robust 60-year-old man. The church declared that the relics of St. Peter had been found. In fact, later examination proved they were a collection of bones from mice, chicken, a horse, a man, a woman, and even a boy. The debate over St. Peter's bones still continues. In the 1960s, Paul VI uh, declared that in fact these are the bones of St. Peter. And I remember uh, reading about this discovery and reading subsequent books and studies of the excavations and the discovery of the bones. And I want to believe that in fact these are the bones of the chief of the apostles. The current position today is interesting because if you go and uh, to the Scavi, they really don't say that the bones are there, but they don't say that they uh, aren't there either. You know, they, they've just sort of totally finessed it. 
For the Catholic Church in this instance, it was terribly important to assert the primacy of Rome as a place where St. Peter died. In this particular instance, the end justified the means for them because they needed to prove to the world that the tradition of St. Peter had gone from the very beginning, from his death, through to the present day. While Peter's presence in Rome may never be verified, by 150 AD, the Bishop of Rome, or Pope, had become the most powerful church leader in the Mediterranean world. In the novel, Langdon arrives in Rome shortly after the death of the Pope and learns that even he has been a pawn of the Illuminati conspiracy. The papacy has historically been shadowed by intrigues and plots. In the church's first millennium alone, two popes abdicated, seven were deposed, and as many as eight may have been assassinated. In those times, many considered the job tantamount to a death sentence. The plot of Angels and Demons is drawn from many real-life incidents that happened in the Vatican, fascinating intrigues, rivalries, poisonings of popes, fierce battles for control of the Vatican. All these strange stories Dan Brown has referenced, he's like gone through the Ripley's Believe It or Not about the history of the Vatican and pulled all of these things somewhere into the plot. The papacy has seen its share of saints and scoundrels through the centuries, as well as monsters like Alexander VI of the infamous Borgia family. He fathered several children with various women and assassinated his enemies to consolidate his family's power. Holiness was not necessarily a prerequisite for the position. When you look through the names of the popes, you see that the, the popes essentially come from the great and powerful families of Italy, like the Medici. They repeat themselves because once the popes obtained power, they put their relatives into positions such as cardinals and bishops, which would help in turn um, elect further popes from their particular families. Yet many popes have been great reformers and spiritual leaders. Most popes, unlike the Pope in Dan Brown's novel, are very vivid, very distinct characters. Looking back, for example, at Pope John XXIII, who was one of the most beloved figures of the 20th century, and John Paul II, is a remarkable figure who reigned for the second longest period of time of any pope in history. In Angels and Demons, Langdon later learns that the pope, who apparently died of a stroke in his sleep, has in fact been poisoned with a medicine that he was taking for his heart condition. Dan Brown is recalling another incident out of history. In 1978, Pope John Paul I died after only 33 days in office. The official cause of death was a heart attack while sleeping. But conspiracy thinkers claim he was poisoned with digitalis by Vatican officials trying to hush up a bank scandal. The death of the Pope uh, illustrates how many people uh, believe or want to believe that there is a conspiracy uh, when it comes to a mysterious event such as the death of the Pope. This uh, was evident with the uh, demise of John Paul I. It's pretty clear now that John Paul I, after reigning only 33 days, was really off his meds for a period of time. And the phlebitis that had plagued him really um, took his life. In Angels and Demons, the Hassassine has announced that he has kidnapped four cardinals and intends to kill each one in a public spectacle that will leave no doubt that the Illuminati has triumphed. The crime will be an exact repeat of the Perga, when, after Galileo's conviction, the church went after the Illuminati with a vengeance. Four Illuminati scientists were branded with crosses, murdered, and their mutilated bodies publicly displayed. But did the Perga, in fact, really happen? Dan Brown sets up a historical event that never occurred. Of course, there were periods of time when the church uh, responded uh, very negatively to perceived heretics, either Galileo to one degree or the case of Giordano Bruno, who was burned at the stake. Other than that, there was no period of time when the church was in the business of rounding up scientists, particularly to torture or, or uh, oppress in different ways. Whether or not the fictional pope's death was a part of the Illuminati conspiracy, the passing of a pope and the transition to the next, as we've seen with John Paul II, is a momentous event played out on a world stage and decided by the powerful church cardinals. They were often from noble families, serving the pope as advisors. Today, they are also executives running the various agencies of the Roman Curia. The cardinals are appointed by the popes. This led to many abuses in the 
in the past where the Medici popes would appoint, not surprisingly, their children, uh, their cousins, their uncles, and that would be a way in which they would perpetuate their family power. The cardinals themselves are a very savvy group of men who know power, know how to exercise power, and who know the rules of the conclave. They've been waiting, in fact, for decades to elect a pope, to have their chance to put their stamp on the papacy and the church in a very special way. During the transition, the person of highest authority is the Camerlengo, his personal assistant. In Angels and Demons, the Camerlengo will seemingly risk his life to save the Vatican. The Camerlengo oversees the sacred ceremony that elects the next pope, known as Il Conclave. The word conclave means with a key, and during the conclave, the cardinals are literally locked inside the Sistine Chapel. The conclave tradition was begun in 1274 by Pope Gregory, after it took the cardinals three years to choose a pope. When Dan Brown talks about the conclave, he's very, very accurate. The conclave is essentially a, a way of putting together some pretty high-powered spiritual people in one room and saying, look, get the job done. As the Swiss guards search for the bomb in the bowels of the Vatican, the Camerlingo decides that the unwitting cardinals are better off in the chapel. But even this sacred place may hold a conspirator's clue. Well, one of the things that Dan Brown encourages uh, all of us to do is to think about these interesting symbols, interesting connections, interesting codes. There were a lot of codes that people expressed in artworks when they did not feel free to express their actual thoughts. In the case of the Sistine Chapel in the Vatican, done by Michelangelo, there is the classic image of God as the old white bearded man reaching out to touch Adam and to breathe the spark of life into Adam. It's the classic, iconic depiction of our culture of the Genesis story. If you abstract out the image of God as this old white man, which is encased in sort of a scalloped shell, and put that next to what's called the sagittal view of the parietal lobe of the human brain, you see remarkable similarities of those two images. So some people have developed a theory that Michelangelo, who was known to work on uh, human cadavers, opened up the human brain, he had seen what was inside it. And in this Sistine Chapel painting, he has actually presented the ironic view that man is not created by God as per the Genesis story. Instead, man is creating God in his brain. Um, a rather provocative notion that one would not have been able to articulate publicly in the time of Michelangelo. Langdon finds the key to tracking down the Hassassin after a desperate search of the secret Vatican archives turns up the diagramma, a long lost coded document from the secret Illuminati leader, Galileo. According to Dan Brown, the archives is one of the most inaccessible libraries in the world. The Vatican continues to serve as a place where political information of a sensitive nature has to be stored. But we have secret archives as part of our, our Library of Congress. There are secret archives in every major national library collection. If Robert Langdon had been a real life Harvard professor who was really doing research work and needed to use the Vatican Library or the secret archives, undoubtedly he would have been accorded access. The uh, idea that there are secret documents relating to the trial of Galileo that never came to light because they have been housed in the secret archives. This is entirely made up by Dan Brown to make a point, no doubt, and to move his plot along, but doesn't accord with what we know of the, uh, of the facts. In Angels and Demons, the diagramma, the secret document supposedly written by Galileo, contains a cryptic map to the Illuminati's secret meeting place. Called the Path of Illumination, the map contains clues leading to a series of symbolic statues and monuments situated in public places throughout Rome. Those who wanted to join the Illuminati had to solve the puzzle and follow the path to the end. There is no diagramma. Uh, Galileo never wrote such a book. Um, 
he not only didn't write it, it isn't in the Vatican's uh, collection. Uh, nevertheless, it's a wonderful plot device. While the facts about Galileo make him an unlikely Illuminati leader, could Italy's greatest Baroque artist have conspired against the church? The works of the church's favorite Baroque artist, John Lorenzo Bernini, can be seen throughout Rome. Galileo's secret document leads Langdon directly to Bernini's sculptures and fountains along a path of illumination, marked by symbols hidden in plain sight. Could this master artist have provided the secret code for his fellow Illuminati? John Lorenzo Bernini is the great artist and sculptor and architect and visionary and almost stage designer of Baroque Rome. He was the favorite of uh, several of the popes and cardinals of the 17th century, and he designed much of the Vatican itself. What we see as St. Peter's Square, the colonnade of pillars, uh, this is all the work of Bernini. The Path of Illumination sculptures are cleverly disguised as religious art, but their themes represent the four elements of science, as they were known in the 1600s, earth, air, fire, and water. The first clue brings Langdon to the Chigi Chapel of the Church of Santa Maria del Popolo. There he discovers the first Bernini artwork encoded with a message only the Illuminati and Langdon can decipher. In that sense, he's probably a great artist to have picked to say, there's a secret code. Well, of course there's a secret code in Bernini. It's a secret code of the Counter-Reformation. It's not necessarily the secret code of a secret society. You want to say, why would Dan Brown pick Bernini? What is there about Bernini except Bernini's works are in over 50 major churches in Rome. I mean, this is not an insignificant artist. You got a lot to pick from, and you have works that are not well known. So pick somebody who then becomes a puzzle. Bernini became a favorite of Pope Urban VIII, the same pope who would befriend and later clash with Galileo. Bernini's art visually defined what it meant to be Catholic. Could he possibly have been an Illuminati leader? I think where uh, Dan Brown's point about the Illuminati falls down uh, is the idea of selecting John Lorenzo Bernini as the great secret member of the Illuminati. And I don't think that that's possible at all. First of all, Bernini's life is very well documented. We know almost everything that he did uh, from day to day. To have been an Illuminatus would have been absolutely counter to everything that he did, everything that he knew, everything that he made. Um, and his art is an expression of who and what he was. There's lots of evidence that he was an extremely devout Catholic, that he was very much associated with a certain branch of what was then emerging as the Jesuit tradition, that he prayed several times a week, if not every day. I don't buy the idea that he was secretly putting all these Illuminati symbols into his work. If we are to believe Dan Brown, that Bernini was the Illuminati conspirator, the four secret Illuminati statues should follow the path of illumination from earth to air to fire and to water. While statues suggesting these elements do exist among Bernini's artworks, could they be the markers on the path of illumination? The four murders are taking place in a specific order. Well, if this path of illumination exists or existed, the, his assumption is that Bernini could make one work at the age of 24, which is then followed by a work that he made at the age of 55, which is then followed by a work that he makes at the age of 30, which is then followed by a work he makes at the end of his life. And that doesn't work. He's out of sequence. At the Kiji Chapel, Langdon follows the angel's outstretched arm in Bernini's statue of Habakkuk and the angel to the next clue. These sculptures often told an allegorical story full of symbols encoded with a visual language that could be understood by a largely illiterate populace. Habakkuk is supposed to go and rescue Daniel from the lion's den. The angel points one way, Habakkuk says, well, I have another job to do over here. The angel doesn't waste any time. What he's going to be doing is dragging him, flying him over to the edge of the lion's den, tossing him in and saying, you know, your job is, by the way, to rescue Daniel. Bernini's commissioned by the Pope to finish the two empty slots in this chapel. This is important because Habakkuk is not looking across Rome. Habakkuk is looking across the chapel at the sculpture of Daniel. 
The next Bernini clue is the West Ponente. This marble disc inlaid in St. Peter's Square depicts an angel-like countenance blowing the breath of God outwards from the Vatican. Too late, Langdon discovers the second dead cardinal, his punctured lungs spewing blood, branded with the ambigram air. Brown is doing an interesting thing because the symbolism in architecture have very, very different levels of meaning. And what he's merely doing is making us rethink what those meanings really, really are. And that's actually the intent of many of the architects, sculptors, and painters of that time period. The next clue is the ecstasy of St. Teresa in the church of the Santa Maria della Vittoria. According to Dan Brown, the statue was originally intended for the Vatican, but it was so sexually explicit that the Pope had it removed to this church. If you go and you look at the statue, you see before you a fabulous marble sculpture by Bernini. But more than that, you get Dan Brown's interpretation that this is a woman having what he calls a toe-curling orgasm. And then you read the diary of St. Teresa on which Bernini based his scene. And if you read her own language, uh, it sounds very much like a sexual encounter. So one doesn't know whether Bernini, the artist, was taking the sexual metaphor that he knew people could relate to and making it something very real about this woman's religious ecstasy or if he was actually trying to conceal a pornographic design within a, uh, a classical sculpture. Brown really kind of falls down and cheapens that work by making it a kind of a simple sexual statement. If you read St. Teresa's comments about this mystical experience, what you find is that she is completely taken over by the love of God as represented by this angel. That work is remarkable because it really brings interior feeling, devotion, and surrender to God, to life. When he's describing works of art, when he's discovering something, he's getting you excited and you get pulled into it. And that's a good thing. However, people have the sense that Dan Brown is telling them accurately what these works are about, how these works are to be interpreted. He's saying, this is the only interpretation. This is the true interpretation. And in many cases, I'm sorry, the interpretation is very facile. The final clue leads Langdon to the Piazza Navona and the Fountain of the Four Rivers. Langdon and his enemy engage in a fierce struggle and he barely escapes drowning. As he fights for his own life, the fourth cardinal, branded with the ambigram water, drowns. How does any intelligent Harvard professor dive headlong into four inches of water? And not only that, it's a square which is busy all the time. So how you suddenly try to drown him in four inches of water, now we all know you can drown into four inches of water, but how Robert Langdon dives into four inches of water and has this uh, battle with the assassin is beyond me because, I mean, it's like extraordinary. In Angels and Demons, each Bernini monument on the path of illumination has also been marked by an Egyptian obelisk. Dan Brown describes this element as proof Bernini was involved with the occult another aspect of the secret Illuminati society. The pyramid is also a symbol that becomes important in Rome during the empire because Caesar conquers Egypt. When Caesar conquers Egypt, all those symbols which are Egyptian become part of the imperial language of Rome. Bernini doesn't go to Egypt and get these obelisks that Dan Brown says are so important on the path of the Illuminati. These were brought by Caesar. Bernini and other architects and designers were asked to put obelisks in front of churches so that pilgrims coming to Rome could find these important churches they were supposed to go to. It was like a you are here kind of map. It was not because they were trying to conjure up some ancient connection to Egyptian uh, spirits. Angels have figured into each Bernini clue. At the fountain, it is a dove, the pagan symbol for the angel of peace atop the obelisk that points to the Castel San Angelo as the site of the next murder. The Castel San Angelo began as a strong point in Roman defenses in the fifth century and was slowly converted into a massive papal fortress. It's infamous for the Passetto, a secret passageway connecting the Vatican Palace to the Castel for use by the popes when the Vatican came under attack. 
According to Dan Brown, the Passetto later became the tunnel popes would use to visit their mistresses or oversee the torture of their victims. The Castel Sant'Angelo was a fortified building with a notorious past, but there is no reason why the popes should have been uh, secreting their mistresses there. They were shacked up in the Vatican in the papal apartments. At the Castel Sant'Angelo, Langdon and the Hessessine have their final confrontation. The Camerlengo has announced to the entire world that the Illuminati have won the battle. Science has triumphed over religion. In the Camerlengo's speech, he says at one point, show me proof that there is a God. And then he says to science, after you've looked at the heavens through your telescope, tell me that there is no God. I think that's an extremely profound statement. It's a common and prevailing thought today that people feel somehow unfulfilled, unenlightened, and they're blaming the encroachment of technology and science on our lives. Is there a book that said, this is the meaning of life, read it, and you have the meaning? They're still working on that. They're still, continue, fine. But to somehow hold science at fault for not finding the meaning of life over a much shorter period than religion has been at it, I think is a little bit unfair. If you just say, God did it, it's like you stop the lines of inquiry in the natural world. In Angels and Demons, Dan Brown leads us on a race against time through Rome, a conspirator's dream city. The reader is plunged into a strange world where nothing is as it seems. A famous scientist becomes a traitor. A beloved artist of the Vatican plots its demise. A pope is murdered. A substance that created the world threatens to destroy it. And a young man turns to evil to bring the world closer to God. In Dan Brown's novel, the unbelievable becomes believable. Angels and Demons can be read as a uh, murder mystery, as an adventure story, as a thriller, or you can see it as a door opener to get into the conversation about the great debate between science and religion. And that's the level that I like to get into the discussion. More people have come up to me personally and asked me about his novels than any other work of fiction, really, that I can remember in uh, decades. I try not to be overly critical about works of fiction as they deal with science, because it's fiction. Give him space, give him room. And he gets a lot of it right, and the part that isn't right, I don't, it doesn't concern me that much. It's fiction, enjoy it. Whether real or imagined, the Illuminati conspiracy in Angels and Demons is a fascinating device that challenges us to examine beliefs we take for granted. The Illuminati conspiracy portrayed in Angels and Demons is only the beginning of another equally fascinating story. The Illuminati will infiltrate the ranks of Freemasons to arrive in America with the birth of democracy.